That again, several, several, I, I guess a month or so ago, God dealing with me in a uh, uh, issue, uh, the issue of prayer. Uh, I began to look at prayer through the Bible, uh, looked at what, what it was, what said. Uh, I began to think about all the messages that I've preached and heard preached. And I think too many times we, we preach and, and we, I don't know a pastor that doesn't want his church to feel and understand and live in the power of prayer. I, I don't think we really realize the power of prayer. I, I think we may have bought books and put them on our shelves and read them about prayer. And, and someone will write all kind of great things about prayer. Many times we get bogged down in what time do you pray? Are you more spiritual if you get up in the morning? Or are you more spiritual if you pray before you go to sleep at night and stay awake all through your prayer? There's all kind of arguments. Do you lay down flat? Do you kneel? Do you lift your hands? I mean, think about the messages you've heard over the years about prayer, and there's substitutes going on. Because we get bogged down in how we formulate prayer. Sometimes we get bogged down in where should prayer go in the bulletin. And y'all remember years ago when the order of service was set in stone. You did not deviate to the left or to the right. When it was there, you did it. If it wasn't the right time, that's tough. God ordained it in the bulletin. Prayer is not one of those issues, folks. Prayer is basically the lifeline of Christians. And, and there's no way that I can, I can measure your prayer life. I, I don't want to measure your prayer life. I'm, I'm busy myself realizing my need of prayer and the need of me being in prayer. And so uh, this morning, we're just going to look at what the Bible says about prayer and trust the Lord to lead you. But I want to urge you and let you know something. When you look at the birth of the church, and when we talk about the birth of the church, you have to relate, I believe, the birth of the church to the birth of the people when the Spirit of God came to earth, filled these people. They were praying for something they really didn't know what it was. God said, where tarry in Jerusalem until it comes. And so they met and prayed until it came, and it came. And it was God's Spirit was poured out on all men. And, and they began to prophesy and speak, and every person that was gathered in that town, and some estimates have been over a million people, there for Passover heard in their own language. The Spirit of God now dwells every person at the time that you receive Jesus Christ. And so you have to equate the church with people. That's something that's been lost in, in the fuzz of religiosity. We, we uh, equate the body. We, we either say bad things like, oh, that church down there, they. Or, or we talk about that church over there is just powerful, it's great. And we talk about it in this term that is not talked about in the Bible. Because when the church is referred to, the church is people. People who have come to know Christ as a Savior, people who have come together and formed a congregation to complete the ministry. The ministry is the Great Commission to go into all the world, into all nations, teaching, reaching, and baptizing. That's the work of the church. Therefore, it is the work of you and I. So is prayer. What really got me was these words you're seeing, ask of me. Have you ever moaned to God that you weren't getting what you thought you should get? Have you ever, maybe you didn't mouth it, but you thought it, well, I pray, but I'm just not getting it. Ask of me. 
So to understand what the Bible says, we have to come to one conclusion. And the question that I would ask you this morning, is God's Word infallible? No haze, no gray area. Does the Word of God mean what it says? And in any type of study concerning what's contained in Scripture, you've got to answer that question. Is the Word of God infallible? then if the Word of God is infallible, what it says, it will do. And and we have to take that. You know, I I don't know where it came from, and and this may be a right answer. But too many times in prayer, I think we let people off the hook by simply saying, God answers prayer in three ways. And we make it sound, these are the only three ways. Yes, no, and maybe later. Later. And you can you can and you know you can write that down in your notes. And when you don't get prayers answered, you can say, okay, that maybe this is made, maybe later. And we confuse the fact of some things that God said. Three words: ask of me. Secondly, we need to understand that though we fear sometimes to use Jesus as the actual model of our life, because he was the Son of God. But on this earth, he was Son of Man and Son of God. And when you read the Gospels, what jumps out at you over all of the miracles that, that Christ did, all of the encounters that he had with people, the healings, the encounters he had with his enemies, scribes and Pharisees and the unbelievers. What you have to understand is there was a quiet calmness about Christ. One time the scriptures record that people just kind of surrounded him. Uh, He was speaking, they said, the the location was near a cliff. Uh, When we were in Israel last year, we as close as we could, according to Scripture, uh, we're at the place where this supposedly occurred. I, I, I don't know if it was. But the surroundings, look, there was a deep drop-off. And, and, and supposedly the people, as I read this, were just kind of backing him up because they were mad. And, after, and it says this, he walked through them and he walked away. Isn't that cool? Think about that a minute. Now you got a mob that's after you. You don't raise your voice. You don't debate with them. You put them on the spot by simply walking through them. What was the secret of Christ? I mean, think about it. How would you feel? What would your countenance be if the very people you came to reveal yourself rejected you And the religious leaders at that time hated you. Don't you think that it it would kind of bear on your face? huh? You know, rightly so, no matter how I feel and no matter how I try to hide it, you look at my face and it tells you the deepest things of my soul. And sometimes that's why I just put a book up when I'm talking to people because I don't want you to see my face. Jesus never had that look. The look that Christ had when he walked among the people drew people to him. And I think it was because in the midst of the storm of their life, his life represented and actually modeled peace. Peace in conflict, peace in want, peace in every area of his life. What was that clue? Well, if you look and diligently, you'll find that he was much in prayer with the Father. He was totally collected, connected with the Father. Oh, listen, John 17 is a powerful picture of the prayer life of our Savior and our Lord and his connection with the Father. And, and if we as people people of God, are to regain the power that once shook the world. It shook governments. It shook people's life. It shook continents. When revival came 
It all started in prayer. Diligent search before God. Now, this is not scientific, but I, I think I understand from reading. There are about 31,102 words in the Bible. I guess that would depend on translation. Prayer in some forms, petitions, supplications, that's as far as I went. Prayers, petitions, supplications. There's other forms of prayer, but just those three are mentioned 600 times. Now, I'm not a whiz in math, but I have a calculator on my iPhone. That means that prayer is mentioned one time every 52 verses. Now, let me ask you, is there a message from God saying prayer is important? Prayer is a necessity. Prayer outweighs everything that we struggle to do because you can do a whole lot more after you pray but you cannot do very much more before you pray. The Bible plainly says it's not just a lifeline, not just to get our request. And let me add that, that God is not up there enthroned as like some uh, Marriott Hotel concierge. My wife and I went to Atlanta one time on our anniversary, and we just told the concierge we need tickets to the Braves game. That was back when I, they played sports instead of making political issues. And the concierge would do that. You go down and tell him, I want a reservation at this restaurant at this time. You'll get back, your phone will have a red button go, and you pick it up, and there's a message. You have this. That's not God. God is a father who is intently involved, interested, and invested in the lives of his children children. And just as you and I as parents want to instill, pave the way, help our children in life to be everything that they can be in life, so much more our Father in heaven. Prayer. What is, well, Paul, I think, two verses, I think, sum up prayer. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, simply pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. The Gospels record, pray and don't faint. You can add in pray and not worry. Pray and not be frustrated. Pray and not be angry. Pray, pray, pray. And we talk about how can I be who I am during the week, my profession? How can a busy teacher in a classroom full of kids that don't want to be there, how can I constantly be in prayer? Well, you can't if you go to the old adage that you must have perfect serenity around you and you must kneel and possibly Fold your hands together in the sublime look of total spirituality. Prayer comes from the mind in the moment that it's needed. How many prayers have been prayed in foxholes and in the midst of the jungles and wars across our line? Men praying and crying out to God, asking God's help, God's protection. The thing that God wants to move us to is so believe in the infallibility of His Word that when we look at the instructions and the teachings of prayer, we take them as absolute life and truth, and we begin in our lives praying without ceasing. Jesus gave a model prayer, and it's a, a prayer that doesn't need to be prayed in rote. It's not something that you have to pray before you pray uh, anything else. And it's not the only prayer that you pray, but it's, it's a model that talks about Father in heaven, hallowed, holy is your name. To me, that's always said, hallowed is your name in heaven and earth and in my life. But sometimes it comes out to a question to me, is God's name hallowed in my life? Forgive my sins as I forgive others. Do I 
forgive others. Let your will be done, even as it's done in heaven and in earth. Let your will be done in my life. And I don't question that will. I follow it. So that's a model. The greatest prayer the disciples ever prayed, I think, was three words. Let's see. Teach us, no, four words, to pray. That's the best pray that you, prayer that you can ever pray. Because I've had people say, Pastor, I don't, I don't know the words to say. I, I, don't, I don't know how to start. I don't know how to end. I, 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 we get confused if you turn prayer into some fundamental work that you are under a burden to do in order to please God. You will be confused all of the time, and you'll get up in doubts. Did I say it right? Did I say it wrong? Did I pray enough? And, and all you know the doubts. If you're praying people, you know the things that Satan can do to discourage your prayers. The Bible says in Matthew 7, Ask, and it shall be given, for everyone that asks receives. Matthew 7, 1, If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? Matthew 21, 22, Whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Now, don't buy the garbage of the garbage that goes out and says your prayers are not answered because you didn't have enough faith. You need the size of a mustard seed to pray, but you need to understand that when you are praying, you are having faith in the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, Almighty God. And so the faith that you exercise in prayer is, is the, the faith that you exercise towards the one that you are praying for and his ability to answer prayer. And Jesus said, if we just have the smallest measurable faith, enough faith to say, oh God, that's where this comes from. John 14, 13. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. Why? That the Father may be glorified. John 15, 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, whatever you wish, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. John 16, 26. In that day you will ask in my name. And I do not say that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father Himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I come from God. Too many times, not only in prayer, but in every other doctrine of the Word of God, we begin to try to write commentaries on that Word. I truly believe that it's not left up to you or I to whether our mind can comprehend fully what God has said in His Word. But I do believe that when we try to tear it down to the point that we can begin to be comfortable with it, we can begin to say, oh, okay, I've got around. I think that we have missed what God has said because no one can think like God and no one understands like God. God speaks to us in a higher plane with a greater knowledge, with a further eyesight. And when the Bible says what it says, it means exactly what it says. Now, I, I know what you're thinking right now. I can, I, can, I can see it out there. Yeah, but what if I don't get what I ask for? Well, I can't explain that. I would ask you to go to prayer and ask God why you didn't get it. But you see, we go look in a book somewhere, another book on prayer. If you're, you know, turn to chapter 12. If your prayers are not answered, do this. And we flip it over. No. We are in a relationship with Jesus Christ. At salvation, Christ has 
God has some way imputed the nature of Christ in me. He has taken my sin and imputed his nature. And so just as Jesus had a prayer line to the Father in everything that he did, many times he'd go away and his disciples couldn't find him. He was in a quiet place talking to the Father. And until you and I realize that we have that same relationship with our Father and we cultivate that relationship through actively talking and praying before God, then we really do not believe that the Word of God is infallible. Let me tell you what happens when you really begin to pray. The first thing that changes is you in the way you pray and the things that you ask for. Now this morning, quickly, let me do a paraphrase here. I'm not saying it's wrong to go to God with personal needs. Not at all. I will tell you, the Bible says, before you go to God with your needs, He already knows what you need. And it's honoring Him when we go before Him and request. You know, it's like I say to my kids and, and uh, little grandkids in the house, kids, y'all can have anything pops of God, but I want you to ask me first. Don't go snatching, don't be dragging it, just ask me. I'll give it to you. I, I think that's that same re approach. But it's a relationship. We begin to change our thinking. What is the most important thing that we can, that I can pray for at this particular time? What, what are the things that will bring God honor, glory, and praise? You see, we hear a lot of talk about praying in the Spirit, and there's a, uh, there's a definition of that which is just nothing. Praying in the Spirit is when you go before God, you're in His realm before Him. He is in your presence, and you open up your heart with every request, every need, every trial that you have, and you cry out to God and ask Him to glorify Himself in the situations, the mess, the praise in every part of your life. Glorify yourself, God. Because you see, that is the aim of man. We were created to bring honor, glory, and praise to God. Ask of me. James 4, 2, and 3 said, you do not have because you do not ask. <laughs> you do not ask and receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your pleasures. Ask of me. That's the one condition God puts in the advance and triumph of His cause. Ask of me is the condition of praying people willing and obedient. You know, we are constantly looking for better methods to do things with, to get things done. I don't know about Mark, but I receive every day emails from people I guess from the tone of their email, they've got it. They got the answers. You want to raise money? Just email me back. I'm going to tell you how. If you want to raise attention or attendance, email me. I got the answer. And so it's just a search and search. You know what? God is not looking for a better method. His method is man. It is man that God has turned his universe over to. It is the body of Christ as we come together in the name of, of Jesus with the heart for people who are lost and, and, and going to die and go to hell. We talk about how, how God's return may be soon. And I'll tell you, for most of us in this room, that's going to be a glorious time. That's a taking away. Take me away. Trials and problems are over, but you, what about the other side? The family in, that is you have that are going to die and go to hell. What about the friends? What about the issues that we have? 
What about the people, let's just say women who are in tough situations in life. Something may have happened to them, and all of a sudden they are forced with a decision of do they abort this child or do they bring him into the world and ask God to help them raise him or find a home that wants a child? Do we pray for the people that are struggling in sin do we have compassion on them, or are we just simply to be judgmental? Those old sinners. I don't know about you, but if God had felt that way about me, I'd still be lost. God cared. My mother, my wife, others cared, and they prayed. You cannot substitute work for prayer because work only brings fruit after it has been planted with prayer, cried over with the tears, praying that God would glorify Himself in that situation. Prayer. Think about the prayers of the Bible. Abraham messed up. One of his lies that he told and all of Abimelech's household, y'all know the story, became barren. <laughs> That's bad for a king back there. They need a lot, of, a lot of children. But because Abraham had lied about who Sarah was, Abimelech had taken her and was going to take her as his wife, and God just closed up the wombs and shut them down. And God said, Abraham, my servant, is going to pray for you. And Abraham prayed and the wombs of, Abraham, of Abimelech and all of his household were open. What about Job? What about those miserable friends that came and talked to him? When you read the book of Job, you'll find out what a miserable friend is. He had three of them. God became so angry at those friends that he said to them, I'm going to have Job pray for you. And when Job prayed for his friends, his problems, his attack, his illness, his testing was over. Because in the midst of all that Job was going through, the loss of everything, his body totally diseased, friends that were mocking him, when Job forgot about himself and began to pray for God's mercy on his friends, Job was delivered. What about Jonah? I'll read chapter 2 of the book of Jonah. Jonah was going to do things his way. He's going to run from God. You ever seen that? Remember that cartoon, Tom and Jerry? I think Jerry was a rat, wasn't he? He'd start running. And, and Tom would just stick his finger on his tail. And the little rat would just be running. <laughs> and you turn around, and there, there's Jerry. That's the way Jonah is. That's the way any of us are when you try to run from God. He just put his hand down, and you'll run in place to get his attention. He even tried to commit suicide. He told the people on the boat, I'm the cause of this storm. Go ahead and chunk me overboard. I'd rather die than preach to Nineveh. I hate Nineveh. The Bible said God prepared a fish. <laughs> prepared a fish. Prepared a condo for him about three days. Jonah got fed up of that. And in the midst of the belly of the fish, he began to cry out to God in repentance. And the fish spit him out. And Jonah preached. What about the city of Nineveh? God said, in 40 days, unless Nineveh repents, I will destroy you off of the face of the earth. Now, let me tell you some things. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It was tried to be built, but you cannot find the remains of Sodom and Gomorrah today. The capital, once capital of, Memphis, of uh, Egypt, Memphis, God out of his mouth said, you'll never be inhabited. You'll never be a city again. You can go see where it was, but you can't see Memphis. Why? Because God spoke, and it was. God said, I'm going to destroy you. When you read, I think it's that fourth chapter of Jonah, that town had such a revival that it said their animals repented. Hey, I'm just telling you what it said. That town repented. 
preaching? How about praying? When Job began to pray, when, when excuse me, Jonah began to pray, he was delivered, and he did what God asked. How about Pharaoh? Do you know Pharaoh believed in prayer? If you follow those plagues, don't pull over the fact that four times Pharaoh asked Moses to pray to God to lift the plague. Four times. And four times Moses prayed and the plague was lifted. How about King Hezekiah? God said, you're going to die. Get your house in order. He turned over to the wall and began to pray. And as he's praying, and Isaiah the prophet is walking out of the courtroom after he had delivered the message to Hezekiah, he's going to die. God sent him back in with a new message and says, I'm going to add 15 years to your life. Let me remind you of the prayers of Ezra, Daniel, Elijah, Elisha, Samuel, and Hannah. Let me remind you, and, and, and don't, don't lose, lose this fact. When you go to Hebrews and you see the hall of faith and you read the lives of the people, they were praying people. And most of the milestones of their life were people who prayed. Now, what was the result of that? He said, for a time, for, for time would fail me to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through their faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lion, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their Back, they're dead back to life through resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept relief so that they might rise again to a better life. And it goes on. Don't lose the fact that their faith was exercised through faith. And in fact, I believe the Bible plainly says before you can walk around ex exercising your faith in this life and the things that you do and the things that you believe, you must first exercise that faith on your knees before God in prayer that glorifies Him. Prayer comes before faith. Prayer knocks on the door. As we pray, our faith is strengthened. You heard that. Many of them overcome, but there were many other prophets that died. They would rather die than deny God himself. What does that mean? Simply strength to go through every issue of life, no matter what it is. You see, prayer exercises all of the aspect of the Christian life. Prayer exercises love, faith, trust, surrender to the Word. It exercises belief. Because that is where the life of a Christian, a life of a follower of God, begins. And it begins on their knees. It begins prostrate. It begins praying. It begins crying out to God. Because when we pray, we put God in His proper position as Lord over all things, and it puts us in a humbling situation that we cannot meet our own needs. We need God. That is what the Bible says. Now, I want to help you this morning. I don't care if you struggle with prayer. If you don't have a prayer life, but you want a prayer life, I'm going to help you. What about, have you ever had your enemies overcome you? I think we're getting a dose of that now, all of us. <laughs> what about that? What, how would you pray? Well, let's see. Here's how David prayed. Oh, Lord, how many are my foes? How many are rising against me? Many are saying of my soul, there's no salvation for him in God. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I laid down and slept. I woke again. The Lord still sustained me. I'm going to give you a prescription this morning. 
Because, folks, you need to have the power of God in your life to go through this world. Understand that. You need it. This church needs the power that comes from its people praying and asking God to give us Flagler County, to give us the city of Benel, to give us Flagler Beach, give us Palm Coast. Lord, put me in front of someone that, that needs the message of encouragement or, or hear my testimony. If this church is to be salt and light, if it's to be make an impact in the community in which God has placed this church and not be some not that is exists and name only, it's going to take this church through its people beginning to realize what the heart of God is. The heart of God is people who are lost. The heart of God is you and I as Christians that we might grow strong in the Lord. And the way you grow strong in the Lord is the more you know Him, the more you put Him to the test, the more you ask of Him, the stronger, the more determined, the better it is to go through this life and not worry what this world brings. Don't worry about what you can't change. Simply live as seeing a land that is better than this one. And if you want to do that every morning, start your day with the Psalms. And if you want to start tomorrow, tomorrow is the 10th Read the 10th Psalm and go forward. So you can start anywhere. And you read that Psalm and you begin to pray that Psalm and I guarantee you, your prayer life is going to change. What you thought you were going to pray about, you move in a different direction. You're going to get up from your knees or, or from sitting in your chair. Your whole countenance is going to be changed simply because you have gone to God with His words. You can look in that, uh, where have I got them down at? Here they go. What about if you don't think your prayers are being answered? Psalms 4, answer me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. You have been my, re my relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. Are you afraid to go to God and say, Lord, why haven't you answered my prayer? Why haven't I heard from you? What is the issue? God will relay that issue because I'm going to tell you what blocks the power of God through prayer. And that's sin in your life. Unconfessed sin before God that you readily, you know it's sin, but you have cuddled it and you have made it your friend and you think you can peacefully coexist with sin in your life. And I guarantee you, when your heart, you're trying to seek God, Lord, I want to know the answer to my life. I'm not asking you to be richer than anybody else, to have more than anybody else. I'm asking you to glorify yourself in my life. I'm asking you to live out your life in me in complete freedom. I realize that I will sin. I realize I will fail. I understand where I'm weak, but I believe you are the strength of my life and when you begin to go to God and cry out that he would make you the vessel that he uses in his hands to glorify himself on this earth as you begin to pray honestly and when you go through the Psalms it answers every everything you will ever come to in life you don't are not removed from this junk that's going on right now but I tell you what you will not walk in fear you will not walk uh, 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 afraid to turn the corner. You, you will not live in a confused state because when you read the Psalms, every time the psalmist, either the sons of Korah or Solomon or David, when he wrote their Psalms, their life was in a turmoil, but there was a calming peace within them because they communicated with a sovereign God who was in charge of this world. If the Word of God is infallible, 
God is at work in the world right now through the good and through the bad. God has not surrendered this world yet. And you know why? I go back on Andrew's sermon. When you read the Thessalonian writer, the Apostle Paul says, he, only he will let until he is taken out of the world. Until the body of Christ is taken out of this world, God's not give up on this world. God's still working in this world. And what God needs are people who can really be called a child of God because they look to their Father in heaven about everything. And before you think I'm trying to get too deeply spiritual, I've been laying my hands and praying on my computer. It'll turn on, but it won't show me nothing. And there's a lot of that stuff I got in there that I need. I pray about my computer. I he hasn't healed it yet. I might have to get another one. I don't know. But you see, that's not the issue of prayer. The issue of prayer is, in fact, in everything and in every way, I entrust my life to the Lord. God has this, we, we just think about miracles. There, there's nothing more miraculous than the way God can change our countenance when we are surrendered before Him. And the top of our prayer list is that we want the presence of God more than we want anything else that we've asked for. See, that's a priority of God. Anything you could ask for without God brings no satisfaction and no lasting joy. Everything you can ask for, along with God being glorified through that, brings you a joy that you cannot describe. And you see, for friends, relatives, those that know people apart from Christ, the greatest prayers that you can pray is ask God to give them the grace of repentance and salvation in their life. I thought about this using my own prayers kind of like a measurement. If I went to prayer for people in my family who are lost or for friends of mine who are lost, as urgently and as vigilantly as I pray for some of the other things that I pray for, I'm, th I'm thinking God would answer those prayers. I may begin to see fruit in those prayers because it comes down to what, what, what's in your heart. What is the basis behind? James talked about Asking for it wrong. There's many ways to pray wrong. To, to put it to our own greed. Let me read you this. Jeremiah 33. God talking to Jeremiah said, Thus says the Lord who made the earth, the Lord who formed to establish it. The Lord is his name. See how God is identifying himself to Jeremiah? <laughs> Jeremiah, this is me. <laughs> I created it. I formed it. This is me. This isn't some other boy. This is me. Listen to what I say. Call to me. Ask of me. And I will answer you and will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. You want to understand this Word of God? And you get on your face before God. 
with right intent and right purpose, saying, God, I want to I want to know you. I don't want to know the answer to questions. I want to know you. And you begin to pray and you begin to ask God, reveal yourself in this. He will show you great and wonderful things. This morning, if you get nothing out of this, other than maybe the encouragement to begin to pray. You see, there's no expert in prayer. He was crucified, placed in the grave, resurrected, and went to heaven. There's you and I, God's creation. Use the Psalms. Use God's Word to pray back to Him in your heart. And you'll see that God will begin to open up your mind to yourself and your world. And there, listen, I, I, I can't tell you the peace, the strength. What's going to come from that? Why? Because God said, over 600 times and talked about prayer, prayer, prayer. And he's left it to us. Father, as I come to you this morning, I pray, Lord, that it has been your words that have flown through me this morning. Lord, the greatest prayer that a person can pray is, oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And when one prays that prayer, Lord, you hear from heaven. Lord, there may be someone this morning, Lord, struggling and wrestling with their life. Don't know the issues. They could be many. Perhaps it's that personal relationship. Jesus Christ, you died on the cross. You died for me. I ask you to come into my life. Christian friend, what are the issues of your life? What are the priorities of your life? I, I tell you, on according to God's word, if you put his praise and his glory in the answer to the things that you ask, and if what you're asking can't bring praise, glory, and honor to God, chances are that's God saying and that's not a prayer that needs to be prayed. I mean, we would, would, would simply commit, Lord, I, I'm going to learn to pray. I'm going to learn how to always be ready to pray. Father, this morning, in my own heart, I have confessed this week for forgiveness. And sometimes I get so busy doing that I forget to pray. And sometimes I substitute doing for praying. And that doesn't work. I just ask you to move in hearts this morning. I ask you to draw us closer to you. Teach us to pray, oh God. Teach us to ask you for labors for the harvest. Teach us, God, that our faith isn't strengthened when we're on our face before you. Have your will and way this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.